Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. This is what's, this is what's happening is, is God has been encouraging me and our staff to look and, and to pour into the next generation. And so I'm taking a break from our Rut to Revival series, and I want to share with you uh, God's heart for the next generation. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 78. It's going to be our anchor text for the day where we're going to uh, read from, and then I'm going to share some insights for you to help us in our journey. I, I'm calling us as a church to come together and to begin to pour into the next generation even greater than what we already do here at Calvary. I just want to let you know that uh, I'm asking you to also get a little uncomfortable and beginning to get involved in helping us pour into the next generation if you haven't. There's a great fight for the next generation. The devil is coming hard after the kids and the youth of our world. And we as a church have a sacred responsibility to make sure we help them grow in love and fear or holy reverence for God. We have, a, we have a mandate from the Lord. We have a command from the Lord. We have a responsibility to be involved in that. And I got a problem when you start messing with our kids. God has a problem with that. And we also, most importantly, should be bothered by what we see. It doesn't take much. I'm sparing you from the alarming and uh, grotesque things that I'm seeing. I'm sparing you from that today because I didn't have a chance to give you a warning of who you should bring into the sanctuary today. But on June 29th is our next gen week and we're having our next gen leaders conference and that's for parents, grandparents, teachers, influencers of the next generation, even you who wanna learn how can we speak into the next generation. Um, that's on June 29th, it will be right in here. We'll open doors at 6.30, start at seven. And we're gonna spend time for three nights learning how to minister to this next generation. Amen. And on that night, I will share, uh, the first night, I will share some alarming and, and concerning things. And so I want to warn you, be careful who you do bring into this room. And we may even have to censor things. That's how bad it is. Or just spare it all together. But it's interesting because we can't even show certain things on these screens in this building, but yet our kids are being shown these things on their own screens or in their schools. And so we need to make sure we're ready to lovingly and truthfully handle these situations. Just so you know, too often the church has been caught reacting and responding instead of proactively preparing. And so we need to be properly preparing our kids for these things coming. It is possible for your kids to know what to think and how to respond when they face the things that are going to come across and they're going to be exposed to. And I'm not saying that we take people out of the world because, well, Jesus says, I don't take you out of the world, but I keep you safe in it and I will be with you. But we do need to prepare and we need to be careful and be ready as a church. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for a moment. God, help me teach what you have to say in your word. Open our hearts as we open your word. And may we receive with humility what you have for us today. We thank you for this vision. We thank you for this direction. We thank you for our young people. Lord, help us to know what to do. Help us to be ready. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Psalm 78 is our scripture. And it says, O oh, my people, verse 1, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them. Even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God. 
See, every generation has a responsibility to believe in Jesus Christ for themselves. You as a parent or as a mentor and a leader cannot force a kid to trust in Jesus. But what we can do is we can pass down our faith in God to the next generation and have them in a culture and a community that teaches the truth of God and therefore they will have a greater opportunity to believe in God. Amen. Amen. We have a responsibility. And verse 8 says this, then, a conditional clause, then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Now listen, no one's perfect. You're looking at your kid right now, you're like, yep, you're right. (laughs) Look at ourselves in the mirror, we're not perfect. But they come around. And when they get older, as we know, the word says, if you train them up, train a child up in the way they should go, and they will not turn or depart from it. I'll speak more on that in a moment. That's our main scripture. So what can we do? And I want to show you some other scriptures. What can we do to raise the next generation for Jesus? Well, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9 had instruction for the people of God, the Israelites. And in verse 6, it says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. One more just plug here. If you're not a parent, I want you to consider yourself a mentor to parents or a mentor to kids, okay? Because we need to do this together, okay? It can't just be on our youth pastor and his team. It can't just be on Pastor Ryan and the team. We have you and your kids for about an hour and 15, hour, 30 minutes a week. There's a lot of hours in a week, isn't there? That's not enough. So it, it comes down to the responsibility on the parents But then also when when kids don't have fathers or mothers or family units, the church must step in. The church must step in. And it says here to have God's commands and his ways on your heart. You know why? When something's on your heart, it comes out of your mouth. When something's on your heart, it comes out of your actions. You see, kids want someone to follow that has a genuine relationship with God. Not one that looks like it at church, but then all of a sudden at home or in public, you don't look like it. The, the, the young people can pick up on the authentic real fast and the fake. They really can. So we must have God on our hearts. He must be so important to us that when they think of us one day, whether you're a coach or a teacher or whether you're a parent or a grandparent or a mentor, when they think of you, they think of God. Because that's how much God matters to you. You see, when God is real and important to you, he will come out in the everyday matters of life. In the up, getting up in the morning and, and going about your day and going to bed and driving a car, whatever it be. Back then, it was different things. But as they did life, they raised their kids and taught them the things of God. And that's an important lesson, too. We don't just sit down and do a lecture to our kids or pull out a textbook. They need to see it in the way we live. See, our faith must be tangible, real. It must be observable. And if it's real for us, then God will be real for them. Where is this all coming from? Well, I was a youth pastor for 11 years. That did help. But now I'm a father of a 13-year-old and 10-year-old. And let me tell you, they will follow you, (laughs) the good and the bad. And sometimes they don't. And parents, do not condemn yourself today. Okay, we're not perfect, we make mistakes, we don't have it all figured out. You know who's greater than us? God. God's greater than you. God knows how to get a hold of a kid, capture his heart, and change his life or her life. So you keep pouring in, you keep loving, you keep praying, and God will do what he does best. But don't beat yourself up today. Don't do that. We all go through different circumstances and different situations. Could we have done things better? Yes. And let me give you a tip. Every parent that comes to me who who didn't do it right, you know one of the best things you can do is you can go apologize to your kid. That's right. That's good, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have done it better. I'm going to start from this point forward. Well, I don't forgive you yet, mom and dad. I don't forgive you yet. 
That's okay. I'm going to still do it better. I don't need your forgiveness to love you. I don't need your forgiveness to love you. I love you no matter what. I see that I messed up. I'm going to fix things. Here's the thing, though, is how do you know if you don't know the Father's love, the Heavenly Father's love? How do you know if you don't know the Word of God and the direction for, for you as a parent, whether it's a mother or a father? We need to be in the Word. So the first point I want to give you is it needs to be personal and it needs to be present. What we need to be is personal and present. Everything I just said is it's a personal experience. We cannot just tell them to do things, and then that's not our personal experience. And then secondly, what we miss when we read Deuteronomy 6 and other scriptures is you have to be present. And we can overlook that point and go, oh, I didn't even notice that in scripture. I know. You can miss it. But you cannot pass down something when you're not present in the moment. And some of us are way too busy. Some of us are way too busy. And then some of us are not busy enough doing the right things for God. And so I'm calling the church to come together and to pour into the next generation, to use your God-given time, to be good stewards of your time, and to make a moment for a kid or a family once a week and pour into them, even if it begins with just prayer, to just pray for our children and our families. We must be personal and we must be present. I'll tell you what happened Friday night. I, uh, I had to become a youth pastor again. My wife and I, it's all good. I love it. And Pastor Brandon was sick, so we didn't want him to trouble him with it. And so I decided to help out, and so did our kids' team and other youth leaders. Thank the Lord, some parents. Thank the Lord for a team. And I'm throwing the cornhole bean bags, watching kids line up for their food. We had 70 kids out there at the beach on Friday night. Yeah. My head was on a swivel. I may have yelled out shark just for fun. But that's what youth pastors do. They have fun. And uh, I'm throwing bean bags. And I, I, I'm not seeing this coming. I'm just throwing bean bags, warming up, you know, just in case someone wants to lose against me, you know. No, not really. I'm terrible at it. And a girl comes up to me, and she goes, so what, what is, what, how, how do I keep my distance with my boyfriend in front of you all? Huh. Okay. Wait, so you, all right. So you care. Right. You care. And we had a 10-minute conversation about finding a man who loves God. About boundaries. And, and here's the thing about that. Um, I've never talked to her other than, hi, great job on your performance, you know, for fine arts. Great job. Um, and that's it. I'm literally just present in their lives for a moment as a youth pastor. Again, yes. I'm throwing a bean bag. And for 10 minutes, we have a deep conversation about what it looks like to be in a holy relationship with God and with someone else at the age of 14. You never know what's going to happen. I never talked to her other than good job, great job on that performance. That's it. One time, and that's it. I didn't do anything to earn that right. So we have students who are hungry for wisdom and knowledge, and we have it. We have it. And, and, and we need to be available. We need to be present. Secondly, we need to preserve and protect. We need to preserve and protect. It was Psalm 78, 6 through 8 that says, So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn would teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God. That's preservation. So every generation is preserved. There's a remnant of believers in each generation for the next generation and the next. What, what is it that they needed to do? Not forgetting his glorious miracles, so preserving their knowledge and wonder of his miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors. So preserving them from becoming like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. We need to help raise kids to love and have a holy, reverent fear for God. Amen. To serve him, to care about obeying him, and to love him. Right now, the world doesn't have a metric or standard of what is holy. 
doesn't have a metric for what is right and wrong. Your truth is your truth. Your right is your right. You're wrong. What is that? What is there? Is there a wrong? These are literally the kind of conversations that are happening on our college campuses with philosophers. There is no right and wrong. Everything is subjective, relative. You decide how you want to live and no one should judge you for it. Well, my goodness, that's what's keeping our world in terror. Well, this is the things that are being deposited in your kids' minds and hearts, whether it's online, through social media, apps, or whether it's even in the school system. We need to preserve and we need to protect. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do right. Seek justice. Well, there, there must be a standard or measure of justice if we're seeking justice. Defend the oppressed. There are people oppressed who need our defense. And right now, there's many cases in our world where people are being oppressed. But we're talking about the children today. The children need someone. Take up the cause of the fatherless or the motherless, and plead the case of the widow. Preserve and protect. Here's a, here's a really harsh warning from Jesus. Jesus preaches this really cute message about accepting little children. If you have faith like them, you'll inherit eternal life. And then he says this in Matthew 18, 5 through 7. He says, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusted me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea because of the judgment that will come on people who cause little children to sin. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. What sorrow awaits the unbelieving evil world because it tempts people to sin. There must be a standard then of right and wrong. Temptations are inevitable. Your kids, you, we will all deal with temptation. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? That is going on in our society of our kids right now. And we as parents, just so you know, inadvertently we can cause kids to be tempted by sin too, by the things that we do behind closed doors as well. And we need to watch ourselves as parents and how and where we're leading our kids. We're called to preserve and protect the next generation. We're called to protect the next generation from sin and evil that is working in and through the influence of our society. And lastly, we're called to provide and prepare. We're called to provide and prepare. James 1, 26 through 27 says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. We need to provide a unit. If, if, a, if a child doesn't have a unit, we need to provide that unit through the church by being big brothers and big sisters and, and being spiritual fathers and mentors. We need to be that. We need to step in I'm telling you, this, this has been burning in me for months. I couldn't wait to share all this. That's why I could have done it. I could have wrote this sermon in an hour. God has been burning in this church to look at the next generation and to provide and prepare them for what's coming, church. They are inadequately prepared right now. Inadequately prepared. They're falling for everything. We have a sacred responsibility as parents and as church members to provide and prepare. Proverbs 22, 6, everyone knows this one. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Some of you may feel like that scripture betrayed you <laughs> because it didn't work. Again, do not, first of all, scripture works. Amen. Okay, sometimes we just don't execute it properly. You know, if we're going to know where to train up a child and where to go, we have to be going in the right place too. One of the reasons why I read my word is because I read it for my kids. If I know the word, I know where I'm going. Because the word of God is a light into my path, a light into my feet. I hide his word in my heart so that I may not sin against him. What we press on our hearts, we impress on our kids. 
Remember, the scripture says to have the word of God in your hearts and then to impress them, leave an impression on your kids so that when they think of you, they think of God. They think of his word. So we have to check ourselves as parents and as leaders and not waste the days that we have and make sure we know where we're headed and we know what to say. So to help with that, God has put on my heart to start a series after all the crazy summer activities, right? (laughs) A series on biblical worldviews. Because I'm asking you to help us reach and help and guide the next generation but you got to know what actually the Word of God says about what your genera- this generation is going through. We need to know. We need to have a biblical framework and foundation of what is biblical. And by the way, there are scholars out there cloaking themselves as sheep, but they're actually wolves. And they're getting doctorate degrees in the Greek and Hebrew texts of the Bible. And then they're saying, well, that's not exactly what that means. Last time I checked in context, it still means that. Amen. So <laughs> the enemy is slick, uh-huh. but God is greater. Amen. And God gives us discernment to see that. <laughs> There's a reason why Pastor Ryan studies deeper and deeper because of scholars like that who would try to come against. And we as parents, we have the responsibility before you ever come to church to make sure you know the word of God as well. And as leaders, because we're going to fill in the gaps where there isn't a mother or father, we have to be ready and know the word of God as well. We all should know the word. Amen. Just a little motivation. So lastly, we can train up a child the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Listen, you can't make something grow. You plant and you let God do everything else. We can water because we put it in the right culture, all right? But you cannot force something to grow faster. You got to be patient. We got to let God do his thing, okay? Plant seeds and let God do the work, all right? Your child will turn, and we pray that they will. But just keep in mind that while we're training, so is the world. So that's why you can't beat yourself up because the enemy is attacking, and we are not perfect. But again, God is still greater at raising our kids than we are. And if you have not dedicated your kids to God, do it in your own home today if you have to. Do it before God because it's all about before God. Amen? All right. And lastly, one of my favorite scriptures about this whole topic, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. This is Paul. He adopted his spiritual son, Timothy. And he says this, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. That's four generations. Paul, Timothy, now teach these truths to trustworthy people. That's third. And then fourth, pass them on to others. See, my dream is that my son and my daughter and your sons and daughters and our children here at this church, that they would be like young Timothys or Tabithas and that they will be equipped to now pass it down to other trustworthy people who will pass it down to other trustworthy people. This is the the ministry of discipleship and multiplication. This This takes being personal and present. It takes being bold enough and courageous enough to preserve and protect your kids, even if they disagree with you. And it also takes us to provide, to be there, to be a a form of provision and to prepare our kids and talk about the Bible with them and give them guidance on how to handle it. Now, look, we're not, I never teach this. I never will. We're not teaching our kids, my kids or any kids, to beat people across the head with Bibles. That's not at all. Please don't hear that. We hold on to the truth and we love people with truth and in love. We do that. And so as parents, we need to keep learning that as well and keep doing that. We must proactively teach, pass down, and prepare our next generation. This is the vision that God has given our church. And I, to be honest with you, until, the, until Jesus returns, that's our vision. It's part of our vision. There's so much more. We're called to reach the lost and make disciples here at Calvary. We need to start in our own house. 
our homes, and in this building. Praise the Lord, we can do it. Amen. We can do it. Before the, the, the next team comes up to present, let me share with you what we're already doing. We have a nursery because we care about the next generation. We call them the littles. And we love having moms that love little kids, that love little ones in that nursery. And let me tell you, it, it makes a big difference for mom and dad to catch a break in here so that they can listen and receive what we're talking about today. And so we're always looking for people to take care. Even one service, one Sunday a month, if we all work together, would help. We have kids' church every Sunday from at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Praise the Lord for our kids' workers so we can also catch a break and receive what we need to receive today. We have kids' club on Wednesday nights, so they're not even done on Sundays. We offer kids' club on Wednesday nights in our kids' room. We have family fun nights so that families can come together and fellowship and support each other, and kids can form shared experiences. And by the way, that's a key thing. Deuteronomy 6 is about shared experiences. It's not about just the kids always being away from the parents. It's about all of us coming together and having shared experiences with God. So bring your kids to prayer nights. Bring your kids to church services every once in a while. Bring them to any kind of event that we have. Of course, you got to be careful with June 29th because there's some serious stuff I will show. But we, we do ministry with them. Let me explain that too. My small group that I'm a part of, uh, we as a group decided that we're going to not meet on Friday nights every time there's a youth one night and we're going to serve our youth. I love it. It's awesome watching our kids grow up and to be serving and having fun with our students. They need to see that the next generation cares about them, yes. that they love them. So we've even sacrificed a group night to be with our youth. And it's not really a sacrifice, it's actually a joy. We have our boys' ministry on Wednesday nights, Rangers, where young men, young boys are having men mentor them in the things of God and learning how to camp and do things in outdoors. We have our youth one nights and our youth small groups every Wednesdays. We have our fine arts that you're seeing. And then we have some upcoming ministries that are taking place. We have a ministry for fatherless boys. Getting ready to start. We had 12 men sign up. And I can foresee a girl's chapter for this as well. And the ministry is called Defenders out of Isaiah 117. We have a pre-team ministry for fifth and sixth graders starting here hopefully in September. That's the goal. Why do we have that? Because we notice that children in kids' ministry are a little too old when they're in fifth and sixth to sing along with the kids' songs, and then they're a little too young to be with the, the youth kids. So we're creating a fifth and sixth grade ministry at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings to help that bridge so that we, by the way, we saw many kids walk away from the church, unfortunately, around fifth and sixth grade. So we're trying to stop that. And then we're going to be partnering with adoption organizations we can't say that pure religion is to take care of widows and orphans and not do something physically about adopting kids that need fathers and mothers. <clears throat> and then, of course, we'll keep doing our conferences to help equip all of us to be ready for right now to prepare our kids and to be ready as well. Now, what's the, what's the easiest way of getting involved? Praying. Serving in any of these ministries, which you can go online and click on next steps and go to ministries and you can start volunteering. Our leaders are ready to onboard you and just be patient because if there's a lot of you, <laughs> it's going to take some time to do interviews. We do background checks on all of our volunteers, just so you know. Yep. So be available to help the next generation in any of these ministries. And um, again, I will be preparing us with a series to help us. This is something we can rally behind together, can't we? We can rally together and prepare the next generation. And I notice that whenever I serve the next generation, it really stretches and grows my relationship with God too. So I'm going to pray at the end after this performance, after this presentation. Um, I just want to warn you again, if you're online, because of copyrights, we couldn't play this whole thing online, so you're going to miss some of this, or possibly all of it. But we're going to pour into the, to the fine arts after this, give a chance to give an offering to help them get to Florida. I want you to know they've already been working hard to get there and raising money, sending out letters, fundraisers, 
And, uh, but we want to rally behind them financially as well. And thank you for your generosity. So many of you have already paid for youth camps and, and summer camp for kids, kids camp. Thank you. Thank you for pouring into the next generation. Let's give it up for our fine arts team. Thank you.